one's in the waiting room. And All Sarah, right. um, it looks like, you, are you gonna handle the waiting room? Yeah, I can do okay. that. Awesome. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Great. Okay, come in here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. All good. Thanks, Gina. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we are talking today about menu engineering and not only how can it can increase sales, but also productivity and help with some decision making. Um, so it does actually look like a couple more people are joining. So I'll kind of wait until um, we see a couple more people in here. But just to give you an overview of how we'll spend about the next 45 minutes together. Um, we'll introduce the speakers quickly, then we'll go right into menu psychology. We have a little interactive activity. Um, and then again, how this data can help drive decisions. And we have um, a guest here today, Becca Alenik from Uber Eats. And we're very excited for uh, her to speak about how using the Uber platform um, can really help with your um, menu engineering as well. So I don't wanna take up too much time, but, um, Hi, my name is Gina. I am on the Street Sense team, a creative strategist. I work very closely um, with Alex, who will take it over in just a second. And as I mentioned, Becca is joining us from Uber Eats. So um, Alex is our director. And if you would like to take it away, I will turn it over to you, Alex. Sure. Thanks, Gina. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to meet everybody. We're really excited to be working with Uber Eats and with Lisk on these webinar series to really kind of try and provide some insights from a lot of the clients that we work with. And Street Sense is a creative consultancy, as Gina mentioned. And what we do is work with building, operating, and licensing uh, large restaurants, bars across the, across the globe. And so we've taken a lot of that knowledge. We were also, all of us, independent operators ourselves one day. Uh, and we've taken all of that knowledge and tried to synthesize it down in some really actionable items to really think through how to leverage some different parts of your restaurant to help you guys make some more money and make some smart decisions, as well as leverage the platforms uh, that we all share now that are so important in the pandemic. And so one of those topics we wanted to cover was thinking about your menu as a tool for profitability and engineering that menu to be most profitable, but also most lucrative to your guests. And so you want to go to the next page, Gina, you know, we've got some core concepts that we want to that we want to introduce. A lot of these are very tried and true ways of analyzing a menu, but it's a really helpful framework as you're going through and thinking about your menu and how to optimize it both for sales and for profitability, thinking about not just what's popular and what's selling, but also what's profitable to you. And so we like to categorize into, into four really helpful buckets. And I'll walk through these and we'll also walk through this as an activity to kind of talk through how we think about designing menus this way so that again, they're really maximizing the profitability in addition to making sure you're selling your most popular items. So first is called a star. That's your most popular dish as well as your most profitable dish. So these are really kind of your standout dishes that customers love and they're also highly profitable to you. They pay the bills, it's restaurant 101. You know, this is what you push. This is what you have your servers sell. This is what you, you sell at the counter. This is what you Instagram. Leave these alone, they're working, people love them. Um, and really kind of lean into these items because they're really your money makers here on your menu and you need to know which ones are working for you so that you can keep a close eye on them to make sure that they stay that way. Um, next is called a plow horse. That's an item that's not quite as profitable, but it's very, very popular. These are important to have on your menu for balance. Um, these dishes really kind of make your Instagram feeds, they get reviews, they show the talent of your kitchen and your staff, they really show off what you do well. They don't perform like the stars from a profitability standpoint, but they pay off in other meaningful ways and they're important to have a few of them on your menu. A lot of people work through their menus and say, oh, you know, these items aren't, aren't profitable for me, so I'm going to start striking them off or changing them. What we prefer instead is to take a holistic approach where you're balancing these two things, where you have some highly pro pro profitable and popular items like that are your stars, but you also have things that are very popular but may not be making you as much money so you can balance them out, but still really show off what you do and what you do well. So the next one is a really important one when working through uh, your menu and thinking about how to optimize it. It's called a puzzle. And the name says it all. Um, it's highly profitable. It's a great dish for your restaurant uh, bottom line, uh, but they're rarely ordered. 
And this is really where menu strategies that we're gonna get into go into play is the description week. It doesn't need to be moved on the menu. It doesn't need to be run as a special rather than a, than a menu item. It doesn't need to be pushed further so that people pick it up. What can you do to make this dish more popular because it's already profitable? The last one is called a dog. Uh, it's relatively self-explanatory. These are the dishes that really kind of play to someone who wants to have them or they feel like they need to be there, but they're not profitable. They're not popular. These need to go off the menu. These, this is really where you need to identify your weak links that aren't performing well for your bottom line and aren't performing well for your guests. There's no reason to try and fix both of those at the same time. It's really preferable to be working on those puzzle pieces where you can look at profitable dishes that aren't making money and invest your energy there, as well as showcasing your stars and those things that are making you interest in other ways, if not profitable. So there are of course a lot of different components to thinking about your menu. So QSRs, quick service restaurants that a lot of, a lot of the, the, the folks here operate and that I personally come from are really good candidates for digital menus. You know, we really think that leaning into having digital menus there can really kind of dis display a variety of different dishes that are in a very visual way to get people to order in a way that makes sense. So we really like that the industry has moved into this space, whether it's QR ordering or digital menus that are available via a site or a full on digital ordering system that we'll get into in a moment. We love leaning into these to make sure they're really optimized, especially in the QSR space, because it's what people are used to and what they're expecting. Paper menus have seen a bit of a decline, of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's also a great backup to have. Thinking about the design of them is a little bit different than thinking about the design of a digital menu, and we'll kind of compare those two different things. And then there are two critical components to either one of these, but they require a different set of skills. First is menu copy. How is, how is, it, how is it written? It's just as important as how it looks. They go hand in hand, and really it's how the customer visualizes what exactly the dish is and triggers them to want to order something. We love to use descriptive words on our menus, crispy, smothered, caramelized, spicy, really trying to evoke feeling and sentiment and try to get the senses going when you're trying to both differentiate dishes from each other, even though they lean on a variety of similar ingredients when things are properly cross-utilized, but also when you're looking at competing restaurants that just describe their items in a generic way, it's a really helpful way to think about how to structure your menu copy so it's appealing, it's appetizing, and it's interesting. Last is menu layout, including the placement and highlighting of a specific item can really help, help you solve those puzzle pieces and increase sales of specific items you wanna highlight. You know, there's a lot that goes into this. There's color scheme and making sure everything is clearly legible, but that certain things pop off the page through the use of color. The application of photos and fonts and spacing, especially in the digital space, when people aren't in your restaurant and don't know exactly what you offer, how do you lean into those items as selling points that are just as important as the descriptions in the online space, but that may not be necessary in the physical space? We like to call something the golden triangle, which is placing key items first in the middle, then in the upper right corner, then in the upper left corner. And those three areas are where people's eyes gravitate towards on a menu. So especially when thinking about paper menus or in-store menus or PDF menu, really kind of think about what people are gonna be looking at first, which is that middle of the page. That's the first thing their eyes are gonna lay onto as they're picking it up or looking at it for the first time. And then they're gonna to scan to the left, scan to the right in those top upper corners. And then the rest becomes additional information that that can be processed later, but you really want to gravitate people's attention towards those items. That's where special boxes should go. That's where your top, that's where your top sellers should go to really kind of lean into the things you want to highlight. And it's where you should indeed highlight special pieces of your menu that you want people to grab onto immediately. Now mobile is playing a really important part and it's, it's looked at a little bit differently on a smaller screen. People work top to bottom. So we're going to get into some of the differences between laying out a menu uh, on a digital menu versus an online menu that you're ordering from or a paper menu. And we'll show a couple of examples that we think do it pretty well. So a couple of in-store examples that we really like and why, and, and, and all of these we have in our toolkit as links where you can kind of read through and kind of learn from people that are doing this really, really well in a simple way. Um, but first is Herb Saint, a little restaurant we love in New Orleans. Um, it's simple, it's sectioned out, it's short, but very descriptive writing. It's not flowery language, but it really kind of keys into exactly what it is that you're selling when you're thinking about these things. And the categories are really clean and simple. 
So another 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 place we like, and this is in the digital space, uh, the Casilla in LA. Um, it's beautiful, it's enticing, it's on brand, it's easy to read, and it's very simple to decipher the pricing and how you scroll through this menu. This is great for something that can be very legible, both on a sheet of paper, but that also is functional as something of a digital kind of menu that you're looking at online or on your phone. And then finally, Cafe La Trova, something we really love, this kind of new format we're seeing where you're not listing the name of the item, but you're rather listing ingredients as a, as a component of the different dishes. If you look here, we're, we're not actually naming a lot of these items. They're really kind of describing what the dish is in a very straightforward way. That is actually a pretty progressive way of formatting a menu to where the title is taking a backseat to the way things are described. However, this takes a lot of thinking to be able to apply to the online space, to be able to provide a name for these things or a picture for these things to make sure it still makes sense in the title and subtitle format of, or description format of say an Uber Eats platform. So we've got some examples of online menus we really like for different reasons too. Um, one is Chilantro, and we love here that, um, you know, build your own has become so popular in this space and leveraging your online menu to do that really well is a challenge. So really thinking through how that works, which items can be added, having a pop out with a step by step and having that building process not have friction is really important. And I think Becca is going to go into a lot of the details of how that comes to life on the Uber platform. But it's something really important to pay attention to if you want to offer build your own to your guests because it mitigates friction in the kitchen, as well as friction with the guests and it's really important to look at it as a holistic experience when you're thinking about designing your online menu in that way. Another one we like is Kale Me Crazy. Um, we love how the, how the menus are separated into clean and concise categories based on a relatively small offering, but it's very focused. Um, they're viewable and downloadable, the nutritional information, which is something that people are very often looking for, especially in the health food space. And beautiful pictures are included as well. And we think this is a really critical component to a, to a high functioning online menu because you don't have that in-store experience, that sensory experience, and you're really replicating your dining space when you're, when you're creating these menus and websites to really entice people to buy. Mm. Um, La Boulangerie is the last one. And we really love this landing page where you can kind of decide exactly what you want to do next before you enter into a, a somewhat less intuitive online ordering system. So it really guides the guests as to what their decision points are when they're interacting and interfacing with that restaurant that offers multiple things to multiple people in multiple places. It's much easier to walk into a store and have a conversation with a cashier or a host and explain to them exactly why you're in there and what you want after them, and they will direct you to the right place. This functions the same way. If you're ready to do a, a takeout order ready today, click here to place an order now, whether it's to go or pick up. Uh, you can plan ahead and do a future order, and that directs you to a pre-booked future order with a time selector that comes first, and then you can have that order be selected so that it takes a lot of the guesswork out of where you're going in the online system. And then they also have an online shop, which links to a different kind of system that offers national shipping to different places for non-perishable goods that they're running on a different platform uh, that really allows them to grab consumers in a different way. And they don't try to you know, shoehorn that into their online ordering system because it's a really different function and workflow. And so they really kind of guide both the consumer, but also their own operations on receiving the right information to the right people. So here's a good look at a couple of menus from the exact same place, but that are done very differently for different applications. First on the left is, is a traditional in-store menu. On the left side, you see you know, appetizers, charcuterie, meat, bread, vegetables, seafood. If you look, it really follows that golden triangle principle where you're trying to kind of put your most popular sort of upsell items there on the, on the left and the right corners. And then in the middle, you have your entree items that are really gonna grab your attention. Um, it's, it's again, a relatively straightforward uh, restaurant menu, well categorized, all on one page, easy to decipher, large headings, you know, really kind of restaurant menu 101. You then look on the right and it's a very different approach online. They don't break it up into all of these smaller categories. They instead encourage people to navigate exactly the order that they want to do in an a la carte setting, they have three different, different areas. One is a dinner for two that they've really programmed only for online where you're ordering these kind of dinner complements that are coming together with all of these things. There's then an a la carte menu where you can order the majority of their menu, though notably not all of it. 
because not all of it travels well. So they've really optimized their menu for that online guest and pared it down to things that do work for a to-go or delivery order, but have eschewed things that don't work so well in the, in, in the delivery setting. And then you can, of course, order beverages with your meal. So they've taken their categories and they haven't just gone one-to-one and recreated their in-store menu, but they've really thought about how consumers are going to be using and ordering and created a menu that's really befitting of exactly online ordering and not of an in-store experience and create a distinction between the two, albeit with the same set of core dishes. And we think this is a really important component of thinking through how your menus might need to be different for online versus in-store, given the operational complexity, the quality of the food that arrives, and the ability for the the consumer to navigate your offerings in a way that makes the most sense for them for what they're looking for when they're eating at home or taking out versus eating inside of your restaurant or establishment. So a couple of other considerations we love to encourage people to think about when they're trying to operationalize some of these things, and we're really excited to get into some activities where we can talk through some of this a little bit, but it's really, really important to consider pricing and not just not just the pricing of the dish itself. A lot of people think they've solved their food costs when they know exactly what it costs, the ingredients to produce, but it's about labor too. How hard is it to, to, to produce? You know, profitability is not just the dollars and cents that go to the bottom line from a food cost perspective of a menu of a menu item price. It's also how hard it is and how much labor it takes and what kind of special equipment it takes, how efficient it is in your current workflow, what the ticket times are, some of those externalized costs that you need to think through too is, you know, does, it, does this require additional equipment that I don't typically need? Or is this something that's specialized that I can maybe pare down and simplify my restaurant operations day to day? Of course, something else we want to touch on too that we're seeing more and more common in, in the space is thinking about the smart usage of fees when appropriate. So whether it's something that's a give back or you're providing additional uh, benefits to your employees, we've seen a lot of that where there's a fee, as long as people are transparent and delivery fees are, are, are a good example of this, as long as people are transparent as to what you're paying for and why the guest needs to pay for it, they're relatively simple to communicate to the guest as to why they, they should, they're paying an additional surcharge. And we see, so we've seen a lot of success in this and being able to add surcharges to people's bills for things that do cost additional money, uh, whether it's your day-to-day operations or whether it's something that requires additional bandwidth like providing delivery service that we'll get into when we talk about the leveraging of the Uber Eats platform. Something we mentioned before in thinking about the publican was meal format. Every menu doesn't have to be the traditional starters, entrees, and sides, you know, especially online. There are a lot of trends in in eating family style, meat plus threes, or things like dinner for two that have become really popular and a simple way for people to order online without so much decision fatigue and without the guidance of necessarily somebody inside the store, but they're still getting a curated experience. We really think a lot of these styles, especially QSRs, are really more conducive to takeout delivery than full service restaurants. So think about how to optimize that experience at home as you're thinking through what works on your menu, not from the old traditional when somebody walks in, sits down or places an order at the counter, but rather from when somebody's in front of their computer and their screen, what is it that they're looking for for your, that you can fulfill the need for? And how can you achieve that with your meal format as much as with the items on the plate? And finally, menu layout, you know, thinking about how to consider, you know, print sizing keywords or even QR codes on the menus themselves if you're doing print menus, but just making sure that everything is really legible, simple, clear, everybody understands what they're getting, what portion size it is, and how much it's going to cost them and your menu layout, as well as laying them out strategically with categories that aren't overwhelming and don't take too long to navigate uh, when, when somebody's online is really critical to designing a successful menu. Great. So we've got a little activity that we worked with, and I'm not sure if Cheyenne was able to join yet, but we had a volunteer work with us. If not, I'm happy to work through with some other folks uh, who want to maybe talk about their PMIX and their understanding of what sticks out to them as the different things that are popular and profitable, not profitable, not popular, and really talking about their menu mix and their menu ideas. So uh, let's let's pause for a minute. Cheyenne's here. Cheyenne was able to join us. She's on. Excellent. Hey, Cheyenne. Good to see you again. Hi there, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Well, so we, we spoke with Cheyenne uh, over the weekend and she was, ha- was helpful enough to share her top sellers with us on her menu. And Gina, if you wanna go to the next page, it might be the most helpful uh, to pick all of our, 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 our memories on Cheyenne's menu and how it's laid out, how it's format. 
And how Cheyenne's uh, P-Mix is kind of indicative of what it is that's working on our menu, but that all of those items may be differently profitable and differently popular. So Cheyenne would love to ask you of your top sellers, you know, I'm gonna pull it up very quickly. Um, you know, your number one seller far and away is not surprisingly your top item right there at the top right corner, your OG funnel cake. Um, how profitable is that menu item for you? Is it, is it popular and profitable? Absolutely. Um, it's always kind of been a bestseller. So the way I started, I kind of just noticed trends within my customers and what they were ordering. And that's how I decided to call that a bestseller. So it is the most profitable and the bestseller. Definitely. Got it. And so note that Cheyenne put that first and foremost on her menu. She's priced it right in the middle of all the other items. So it kind of occupies that sweet spot. So it stays profitable, but that also isn't going to be sort of the splashy purchase that someone's going to sort of lean into. And that it's really kind of treated as something that, you know, the OG, it's, it's, it's exactly what you're coming here for. This is a staple of fun diggity funnel cakes. And it's something that she's really highlighting. And I'd imagine it's what, if somebody comes in and asks for a recommendation, that's what, exactly what you're gonna be, gonna, gonna be telling them to get, right? Correct. So talk about some of your more expensive dishes. Um, what what in, amongst your top sellers is more, is, is more pricey for you to produce either from an ingredient perspective or just time and labor? Is it, is it the larger splashier banana split funnel or something like that? Mm -hmm. Like this is something that's popular but may not be making you money? Yes, so um, I would have to say the red velvet funnel cake, actually. Okay. So because I have to add extra ingredients to the already existing funnel cake mix, I have to make it chocolate. Yeah. Um, so that that cost is not really accounted for, but that funnel cake is still a bestseller, so I keep it on the menu. And it's just all about like kind of having versatility for me and being able to offer something different that most other funnel cake shops don't offer. So that mm -hmm. makes it stand out automatically, which keeps the sales decent. But um, as far as not being as um, profitable, I would have to say the infamous red velvet, even though it's popular. Got it. Yeah, no. And that those are things that are providing you value, as you said, in other ways. You mentioned that it's a differentiator. So other, other places that are doing what you're doing aren't doing that. It's also got its own challenges, right? Because you have to produce a separate batter. You have to have a separate skew, a different, a different process to, to execute it. So it's something you've done thoughtfully, but not something that, that you're unaware that, okay, well, people love ordering this. It shows really well. It, it, it creates a little bit of distinction between us and, and everything else and on the menu itself if people want to come back again. But you're not trying to maximize the profit of it necessarily because you've got other dishes that do that for you. Correct. Perfect. So what, if anything, on this menu have you been tweaking with recently that may not be working on either front? That's just not selling all that well, but that also isn't bringing in a lot of money. Do you have anything on your, on your menu that you thought about taking off for those reasons? Absolutely. So when it comes down to, because I do have a build your own menu. So when mm -hmm. it comes down to some of the toppings I offer, like peanut butter, drizzle, um, Nutella, those items sell, but they're not that profitable. A lot, a lot of people may not order them because those toppings aren't on my best sellers, such as the OG. So mm -hmm. they're not as prone to order those items. So sometimes I debate with myself if I want to change out certain toppings that I offer, such as peanut butter, because there's peanut butter lovers out there, but not everyone gets them on their funnel cake, especially if it's not a bestseller. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have peanut butter listed. So it's just things like that. And trying, especially with a build your own menu, trying to find that balance between what are good toppings to have for them to build their own so that they're all equally selling. So mm -hmm. I would definitely have to say, oh, and vanilla wafers as well. So vanilla wafers is one that m people mostly only order with the banana split funnel cake. So when they add that um, additional um, topping to the banana split, I do make a profit because the banana split is uh, pretty equal or a little bit higher than my OG funnel cake. But mm -hmm. I don't sell vanilla wafers often on other funnel cakes, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. And you brought up a really good point because you've got an interesting menu dynamic where build your own. You've got to be very careful to make sure that people, you know, people are pretty smart and they'll come in and they'll start like start from the build your own and try to get try to get away with spending less. For example, we had a little bit of that 
um, in a sandwich shop where people would try to kind of build their own sandwiches equivalent to one of ours, but uh, that, you know, it would, would be like 10 cents less because of the, the, the arithmetic. So you got to kind of do a little bit of the math to think through people's decisions. I love the idea too of leveraging build your own toppings to add to your bestsellers as additions. And I would encourage you to think about the way you word build your own and, and some of the toppings to make sure that people know, and maybe it's just a little, little line under the bestsellers that, that it's infinitely customizable because I think that's a selling point. It's a selling point for people to, to feel like they have control. They might want a starting point, like you said earlier with the banana split, but then they might want to add a couple more things to it. And then you're really doing well on some of those more expensive items because you're do, you're basically upcharging things that are coming at cost, but it's just more top line for you. So it really kind of helps turn the tide because it's over, you know, it's overflow from what's an already profitable dish to now more revenue on top of it. So maybe thinking about adding um, language so that people feel encouraged to do so. And, and also potentially online, which we'll talk about in a minute, whether that can be automatic, where it says, would you like to add any additional toppings? And there's a nice list of things on, right underneath that are easy to add, don't cost you a bunch of money, but that people can, you can get an extra dollar or two out of folks. Yeah, so I do, I, I resonate with the previous um, restaurant you showed where they had two different menus. Mm -hmm. So this Kind of like my in-store menu but on the uber platform and other platforms i do allow them to add on toppings and even take off toppings that they don't want so Perfect. that is available yeah yeah i love i love having that distinction and and using your online menu a little bit differently build your own is really hard online because they don't know what it is or you know how it how it really works and not having a starting point is hard it's doable uh, but it, but it's it's sometimes more challenging, not only for the consumer, but also for you, because you're looking at a ticket that's 14 items long because somebody's just sort of clicked through a bunch of different things. And then pricing it is always really hard online, too, because, as you know, people will type in extra stuff in the notes and, yes. you know, try to get away with a little bit more or have, you know, can you can you double this for that for me, double that for me. So I really like the approach of starting from the base, having allowable modifiers and then, you know, also communicating that you, they may be charged additional for what they put in the notes, which takes a little more work, but might be worth kind of thinking about how to do that and go in and then adjust the order based on what they're actually ordering based on the notes. That's a good point. And that's kind of what I'm struggling with because I get so many tickets at one time that I don't really have time to go in and adjust orders when they do leave comments like, Can can I add Nutella when really it was a modifier there for them to add Nutella themselves. So I am trying to make that a little bit easier. And I am seeing the disconnect between my customers, not really understanding that part when they mm -hmm. are building their own. But besides that, yeah, it's great. <laughs> gotcha. Understood. Yeah, I think that's a struggle for all of us, especially when, when there's not time to do so. And going back and fixing it after the order has been executed almost feels a bit disingenuous for the guests. It's like they already paid for it. Now you're going and adjusting their order. So I I understand a lot of that. I think Becca is going to cover a little bit of that with being smart about modifiers. So I think we can have a healthy Q&A about that. So with that, I did. Thank you so much, Cheyenne, for sharing all this and, and talking through. Um, I think we covered a lot of this ground here. And I think that the approach that Cheyenne takes with her menu and how she organizes and just being analytical about it, too, and, and being OK with making adjustments and being OK with leaning on your data and thinking about, OK, my check averages are trending up. What can I do to keep making sure they go up? Or, hey, these sellers aren't working quite as well as I anticipated. You know, is it time to adjust and take them off the menu because they're not profitable and they're not popular? Or something is really profitable, but it's not moving. Can I change the description? Can I change where it's placed on the menu? Can I talk about it in a different way so that it becomes more uh, popular in addition to already being profitable? <clears throat> Great, so I think would love to turn over the floor to Becca and to have her talk through some of the items um, that she's prepared about the Uber Eats platform itself and some of the ways that we can really leverage this Intel to make these online menus more intelligent and thinking about how to leverage them to, to, to get the most out of your menu online. Awesome, thanks Alex. Um, can everyone hear me okay? okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so first off, I know that a lot of menus come in all shapes and sizes. However, on the Uber Eats platform, it is pretty standardized. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, a couple of tips on first how to make it functional, usable, accessible, and then to take it one step further and make it a good menu so you can differentiate yourself on a platform that 
is pretty standardized um, across all restaurants. So if we go to the next slide and the next slide. So starting off basic. So if we use the analogy of like building a house, this is the building of the house. This is the foundation. So first and foremost, accurate uh, menu hours. This is so, 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 so important. Um, and on Uber Eats, you can actually customize um, your hours based on your menu. So if you have a breakfast menu, you can do it, you know, from nine to noon. You can do your lunch menu from noon to four. Um, and oftentimes what we see is that the most missed orders happen at the opening hour and the closing hour of restaurants because merchants don't have accurate menu hours. And especially holiday hours, um, make sure to keep those updated. Uh, because we see a lot of missed orders then as well. Um, so first and foremost, have your menu hours correct. The next, um, we kind of went through it with all the modifiers, but the menu structure. So condensing the items into one item whenever, uh, whenever possible. So in this example, we could honestly just keep it up one more level and just have pizza. And then you can pick your size, 12 inch, 14 inch, and then your and your type of crust and then your sauces and then your toppings on the left and your toppings on the right. Uh, it's just more intuitive for an eater because they don't have to scroll through and find the very specific item that they want. Instead, they can just start on one item and start customizing. Um, the next is just correct modifier group setup. This is very, very small, but very, very important because it could hinder an eater from checking out. So for example, I've seen a burger place that they had a required option for a bun, but the two options that they offered were bunless and lettuce. They didn't put in like the, the standard bun. So they weren't getting a lot of orders because not a lot of people want to be healthy uh, when ordering a burger. So that's definitely one thing um, to pay extra special attention to because it could just um, not allow eaters to order at all. And the last one is accurate category tags. So within Uber Eats, you kind of have two options. You can do a category tag and you can have a searchable tag. A category tag is what is shown right under the title of your restaurant on the Uber Eats platform. So it says kind of keywords um, like American, healthy, vegetarian. Um, making sure that those are accurate is very important. So for example, if you offer just a salad on your menu, but then most of your menus is meat-based, don't put vegetarian um, because that just loses um, eater trust in your in your restaurant. So make sure that your tags that you have are very accurate to whatever cuisine that you are are selling. And then searchable tags are on the back end. So it's not, um, sorry, one more. Um, Searchable tags are not visible to eaters, but um, it it um, occurs in the background. So if you have, if you want to put like um, Asian, but your store is Japanese, um, Asian would be a good searchable tag because when people search for it, it'll still come up, but it won't show up in um, as a category tag right underneath your your title. So that is very basic. That's the foundation of of your restaurant. So um, as long as you nail these, you you pass the first step, you build the foundation of your house. Um, so the next slide here has the lightweight levers. So I'm thinking about this as like the furniture that you put in your house so it's livable. So first is optimal category order. Um, so this has to, don't put like your sides first and then your dessert and then your entrees and then your appetizers. It doesn't make sense. Um, again, we are searching on, um, on the Uber Eats online. So you're just scrolling through. So it has to be in intuitive order. Next is clear item naming. So um, oftentimes I see this in uh, like Mexican restaurants. They have chick they have a, a category that's called burritos and a category that's called tacos. And then they have chicken for both. Uh, and then sometimes on a ticket uh, on the merchant side, when the ticket is printed, it just says chicken and doesn't say chicken burrito. So just making sure that all of the naming is very, very clear to whatever item that you're selling. Uh, likewise, the description, making sure that you list all the ingredients that are on whatever dish that you're ordering. Um, 
Uh, and also if it's a side and it says like veggies, be more specific on what type of veggies that um, those are, because again, in online platform, you can't just ask your server. Um, and another thing is here, this is a good spot to call out if something is gluten-free or vegan or vegetarian, things like that. Um, next, we talked so much about modifiers, but they're so, so important, um, but make sure that it follows um, a nice order. So it's like choose your size first and then choose your flavor. And then um, what we really encourage is we do um, encourage merchants to follow the choose your format. It just makes it a little bit more personable. And it's uh, it's what we at Uber Eats like to see across um, our modifiers. Next is optimal cuisine tag. So kind of touched on this earlier, but just make sure that um, they are correct and you are using them um, effectively. So making sure that, you know, all of the categories that you could include are included. So then you, you show up more on um, either the carousels or the feeds um, when eaters search. Photo accuracy, this seems pretty obvious, but making sure that your photo actually corresponds to whatever your eater is ordering. So if it's a picture of a burger and fries, but the item is just a burger, it's misleading to the eater. So it could cause some confusion. And lastly, a modifier option setup. So that's within um, within the modifier groups, just making sure that um, everything that could be customized um, does have the option to do so on the online platform. So that's kind of like the furniture part of the house, like kind of the table stakes. And so now we'll go into the, all of the decor that we can put into a house. So um, meal completeness, just making sure that your menu, if it if it allows, um, has appetizers, has entrees, desserts, sides, the whole nine yards, um, just making sure that the eaters have the ability to build a full meal um, on your on your platform. Uh, the next one is combos and family meals. So this is probably the single most um, important thing to increase your basket size is to offer combos, is to offer family meals. If you have an alcohol license and you are and you're in a state where it is allowed to be sold on an online platform, please add alcohol onto your menu. It is a game changer. Um, but you could do um, kind of like Alex mentioned earlier, but since you're not in the restaurant, you can't say like, oh, like what wine does this pasta pair with? You can do that for your eaters on the platform and it will increase your basket size because sometimes as an eater, you're not even thinking about what wine would pair well with a pasta, but then you see it right there in your face and you're more likely to order it. So definitely bundle wherever you can. It's a huge, huge um, lever of increasing basket size. Um, and then, and it also just helps guide eaters as well. So, because again, you can't ask your, your, um, your waiter like, oh, what goes well with like the burgers? Like, oh, the onion rings, you have to get the onion rings with the burger. Um, so definitely bundle where possible. Um, another thing is adding additional offerings. So I've seen lately that a lot of pizza restaurants have been like offering Ben and Jerry's um, because pizza and ice cream go so well together. So if that's an opportunity for your store, um, definitely leverage that opportunity. And again, alcohol, it can be severely overpriced on an online platform. So just, just leverage that. Um, it's, a, it's a great new offering that Uber, Uber now allows. So if you have an alcohol license, submit an alcohol menu. Um, another thing is uh, cuisine-wise popular items. So for example, if it's a Thai restaurant and it doesn't have a pad Thai, then that's probably an issue. But it obviously depends on the type of restaurant that you have. Um, if it's a very, you know, you offer unique offerings, then it obviously doesn't apply to you. But um, usually when eaters are searching for Thai, they, they want to see kind of the, the, um, the, items that they are most familiar with. Photo coverage, huge um, on an item or on the platform. It's very hard to visualize, especially if there's not a good description. I specifically love seeing photos on like sushi restaurants because I like to see what the roll looks like. Um, and we do find that 
uh, Peter's gravitate towards items with a photo. Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely including a photo at the very least on um, the uh, the stars and then the the one with the plow that Alex was talking about earlier. Um, plow horse. Plow horse, thank you. Definitely, yeah, definitely include photos for those um, because they're going to drive um, the most profit for you. Um, and then lastly, this is just a plug on a, an Uber Eats product. Um, it's called menu optimization. All merchants are automatically opted in. So just make sure you don't opt out. But this is, um, these are the features that when I'm an eater and I'm going into your store and it says like picked for you, or it says popular items, or when you're checking out, it's like, hey, do you actually want to add some spring rolls? And that gets me every time because it's usually the items that I'm like, oh, I shouldn't. But then it prompts me at the end and I'm just like, all right, well, it's a sign. I have to add it. So making sure that you don't opt out of that. Again, all merchants are automatically opted in. So no worries there. Um, so that's the decor. Um, so that basically just walks you through kind of like table stakes and then really how you can differentiate yourself on a standardized menu. And I can take questions now if anyone has any. Thanks, Becca. Of course. I had a question and this was maybe helpful for the group. If um, a restaurateur is looking for a little bit of guidance uh, once they're inside the platform, do you, does Uber Eats have, you know, videos or FAQs? Like what's the best way for them to get additional guidance through the platform itself as they're, as they're starting to work through some of these principles? Yeah, the biggest thing is there, there are online resources. Um, I would say the best thing is to reach out to your account manager because they, they have a lot of experience in, in menus and they have a lot of experience of other merchants menus. Um, and so, and then they get all of the spiels for me. So they, they will be the experts on that. Um, also just reaching out to our support. Um, if you need kind of advice on how to optimize your menu, that's a huge one, but there are online resources just on the, on the merchant website and on, um, Uber Eats manager as well. Does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, hello. Hi. There's a lot of information. I've, I've been taking a lot of notes. I have more questions than answers right now. So <laughs> we'll probably have to reach with my account manager because I learned a lot today in this 45 minutes. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, we taking a few snapshots of the screen because there's a lot of good info there so good that's great to hear also um in the larger toolkit um there is a whole section on this as well with references that link out to specific um websites and and such so okay. if you have time to dive into that the actually the resources related specifically to menu engineering are on page 29. Um, I just wanted to refer people to that since it's such a large document and I know everyone is busy, you might not have time to go through all of it, but the menu engineering section is right around page 29. All right. Yeah, so and idea about the in-store and online menus. I never thought about it. I was always running the same type of menu. So it's a great idea. Yeah, and sometimes it, it you can be a little bit more experimental online, meaning you can pare down a little more, you can use data because it's so responsive and so easy to see on the Uber platform and others, how things are performing. And so you can really kind of tinker more online because it's a relatively easy fix versus change, you know, changing a button on the POS and, and you know, reprinting menus or redoing right. menu boards. It's a lot easier online to make adjustments. And so you can really kind of use that as, as how you're proving out menu items uh, and, and really kind of paring things down for your guests and diners, uh, I think is something that we've seen a lot of restaurants have success with uh, because not everything 
travel's great. Not everything is optimized for, you know, getting to a guest and being eaten at home versus in the restaurant. And I think diners now have so much experience ordering online. They just didn't have before that they're, that they're receptive and welcoming of some new formats that, that have been, you know, a challenge for people to adopt over time. But now just again, for a long time, that was the, the way, the only way that people were eating out. And they've learned a lot of lessons from that. And I think some of those can be positive for restaurateurs as to how to take advantage of the new ways that people eat. I think Becca hit on a really, a, a couple important ones, which is really thinking about how to maximize your basket size or your check average through your online platform, because it's the one place where you really can't replace somebody saying, oh, well, when you order this, also, would you like that? Or even just asking you, would you also like a dessert? Would you also like a wine? Would you also yeah. like a something else through that face-to-face uh, -face interaction? So having that optimization on your menu so that people feel really comfortable ordering more, I think can actually drive up your check averages even further because they there's a little bit of guilt sometimes when people are talking to a human and ordering more and more and more. But I think online people don't feel that. And so people are kind of encouraged, well, it's already, they're already delivering to me. I'm already paying the delivery fee. It's already, already coming to my house or I'm already going to, you know, get in my car and pick it up to really kind of add in a couple more things that may not have success in store, but might be really functional online too. That's right. That's right. And there's a lot of good points. A lot of good points, Alex. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. And we would definitely encourage you, as Gina said, to look at the toolkit. We hope it's an evergreen resource because it, it contains a lot of links, both to other restaurants. And we kind of highlight what they're doing and why as little case studies and really just kind of building a little bit of ideas around who's really kind of doing in, in innovative stuff and whether there's anything to learn there for individual operators such as yourselves, but also additional resources that are sort of more immersive FAQs or step-by-step -step tutorials on some of these principles. Like we'll link to, for example, in the menu engineering section, a whole menu engineering course that you can run on your menu itself or on tutorials on menu psychology. So you can look through all of these different principles that we just lightly touched on. But if it's something you, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and redesign my menu. I wanna, I wanna learn a little bit more. There's a lot in there for that. I encourage you to, to click through and use that as something that can help highlight some of the more nuanced things here. So the toolkit is, is on the Uber Eats app or, or where, where can I find it? I think it was sent to all of you guys via email. We'll follow uh, up again and resubmit it, it as well, just so that you guys, we'll, we'll keep sending it out so that people don't, don't lose it. Um, and we'll make sure that everybody has that. And um, I'm, I get think I have a link to that. I gotta go back the next one as well. Yeah, I, I, I get a lot of emails. So I gotta go back on those things. Cause I don't know where it is right now. We'll send, we'll ask Sarah actually um, to send again, perhaps after um, we're doing a couple more of these webinars about different topics. Um, and then perhaps we can get kind of like a running list of people that might be interested in, in getting that at the top of their inbox again. Yes, thank you very much, Gina. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Manuel, I was trying to grab it really quick to put the chat, to put the link in the chat. Oh, um, okay. And I can just email it to you after as well. It, it's somewhere oh. in your inbox, but we'll just bump it up for you or I can um, I, try I to find it real quick now. and I'll just I put it the in the link. chat. I see the link now. Thank you. Okay, yeah, great. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cheyenne. Thanks for, for joining us a little early and talking through your menu and great to meet you, Manuel. And for everyone watching the recording, we hope you find this helpful and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Becca. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, okay? You too. You too. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.